Learn about herbaceous grafting, a method of propagating plants. Well, what they do is they graft tomatoes onto potatoes. Funding for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership and the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by Swiftel Communications. Welcome to Garden Line. I'm Stephen Monk. Tonight on our show, we travel to Rapid City and visit with Extension Horticulture Educator Rick Abrahamson. Rick demonstrates herbaceous grafting as one method of propagating plants. And as always, our panel of lawn and garden experts will answer your questions. So get ready to call in. Our panelists are here with the most up-to-date information about gardening, lawn care, insects, trees, and a host of other lawn and garden related concerns. Joining me in the studio to answer your questions is John Keekafer, Brookings County Extension Educator, David Graper, SDSU Horticulture Department Head and Extension Horticulturalist, Mike Meckning, Extension Weed Specialist, and KC Jensen, SDSU Wildlife and Fishery Sciences. You can start calling now. The phone number for you to call with your lawn and garden questions is one 866 595-SDSU. Again, that is 1-866-595-7378. Helping to answer the phones tonight are your folks from the Brookings Area Master Gardeners. And remember, when you call in with your questions, please provide our, your phone volunteer, provide our phone volunteers with as much information as possible about your garden problem. Be ready to provide a description of the problem, when the problem first appeared, whether it is affecting any other surrounding plants and moisture and or soil conditions that exist around the plant. But first off, we're going to go around the table and hear from our panel on what is currently happening out there. And we're going to start with you again tonight, John Keekafer. What's happening in the insect world? Well, we've had a lot of wet weather lately. It's been a little bit cool starting off. And we had a question last week about grasshoppers and how cool wet weather might affect grasshoppers. And I said, you know, West River, the wet weather for West River isn't maybe enough to affect the grasshoppers. But I brought in some examples of some things that we're seeing increase in numbers because of our wet conditions, or at least moist conditions. And uh, these are things some of them people have already had problems with, and some of them we haven't seen show up too much yet, but we'll see probably in the near future. First one is just one of the common slugs. This is uh, on a hosta, and we get a lot of questions about slugs eating hostas. And, these are one of those, they love those really moist uh, conditions, those shady areas and places where there's some cover. And so it's not, I think, probably necessarily that they like the hostas better than anything else, but hostas are a palatable food and they're in the right place for the slugs to be living. So if you find yourself dealing with slugs, you know, really your best bet probably is going to be to try to control them with uh, one of the bait products that's available on the market, an iron phosphate, uh, phosphate or else the uh, metaldehyde products that are available. And they're baited, uh, you put them out and try to keep pets away from them and probably have to repeat that a few times to try to control the slugs. Another one that people see coming into homes and they like those same sorts of areas are millipedes. These shouldn't be confused with centipedes. The millipedes are, are uh, usually a little bit higher profile, they're not flattened the way the centipedes are. If you look at normal centipede, the legs come out on the sides. And if you look really closely, they've got one pair of legs per body segment. Millipedes generally have two pairs of, body, of legs per body segment. They're more rounded, a little slower moving. And they feed on dead and decaying plant material, some animal material, things like that. They're not predators. They're not going to be out eating uh, other insects or things. It's just what's already there. 
But we get a lot of concerns of them coming into homes or being around homes or under objects that are in those moist areas and people pick them up and find these things on them. This is one that really, especially coming into a home, you don't need to do anything to control them other than sweep them up and throw them out. If people ask all the time if a barrier product would work. It will kill them, but they die after they come into the home. So you either sweep up dead ones and throw them out or sweep up live ones and throw them out. I'd say just sweep up the live ones and throw them out. They won't hurt, harm anything in a home. They're just coming in. And then the third one that we've got is an earwig. And these guys, so far, I haven't seen very many of them. But the last couple years, when we have slugs and millipedes showing up early in the season, in probably just a few weeks now, we'll start seeing greater numbers of earwigs building up. They like those same sort of conditions. They like that wet weather. They like those very moist microhabitat conditions where they can get into those places, get some protection, come out during the evening or at night and feed on leaves and other plant material, and then during the day they hide in those areas. And it's important to distinguish those from either the millipedes or the slugs because control is going to be very different on them. For an earwig, you're going to consider control very much the same way you would for a grasshopper. Very mobile insects, they're going to cover some pretty good distance at times probably going to look at modifying that habitat, trying to take away their hiding places first, and then putting out some general insecticides if needed in some of those cases to, to clean them up in those pocketed areas. Okay. So a number of specimens of insects that are starting to show up in larger numbers this time of year. And now the millipedes, those, they're the ones that if you touch them, they curl up kind of like a coil of rope. Right, and exactly. The they well. will almost always curl up. They'll roll themselves up a little bit. They don't roll up into the ball like the uh, isopods, the roly polies or sow bugs or pill bugs do. But they will coil up like a rope. That's a pretty good description yeah. of them. And they can leave some dark stains on things if you grab them from some of their defensive chemicals. And the slugs, from what I understand, the baits, uh, what I heard one time is that you want to follow the directions because if you actually pile the bait up, it can act as a repellent where they stay away from the bait. Right. So you want to make? Okay. Yep, you need to follow those directions really carefully, especially the metaldehyde products are attractive to dogs in particular and can be fairly uh, bad for a okay. dog, I think would be the, the mild way to put it. So right. if you have pets, try to keep them out of those areas or pick a product that wouldn't have Ashes them. don't work that well? You know, I've heard people say oh, ashes work. I've had, uh, you know, the beer baits, a lot of people will try those. And in some cases, you may have a little bit of luck with them. Generally, if you have large numbers of them, large enough that they're eating those hostas back, you're going to want to, first of all, modify that habitat, get rid of mulch and other hiding places where they can hide, and then use those bait products, and that'll usually take care of them. Okay. Thanks, John. Yep. David, what do you have for us tonight? Well, it's been so wet out of McCrory Gardens, we've been hoping to get busy with planting out of the gardens, but there's water standing in the planting beds, there's water in the lawn. So we've been, I've been trying to keep the crew busy doing whatever we can find and uh, what we've ended up doing is kind of cleaning out some areas in the gardens that have kind of got a few weed problems. And I don't want to jump on, or get in Mike's territory here too much, but I brought a few weedy, woody plants that I wanted to mention. And these are things that people might have coming up in their own yards. We've had some pretty wet conditions, not just this year, but the last few years. And that's ideal conditions for a lot of these seed, uh, tree seedlings and, and shrub seedlings to germinate and start uh, producing these plants. And this first one is my number one enemy out at the gardens, and it's also a very common weed plant in shelter belts and so forth around uh, the area. This is common buckthorn. And we usually get samples of this plant later in the season when they're producing the little blackish berries, and people confuse them with uh, uh, choke cherries. They think they're choke cherries, but you don't want to eat these fruit. They'll give you diarrhea and make you sick, so don't eat them. But uh, they have a pretty distinctive leaf with these very prominent veins on the leaves. And here in another couple of weeks, we'll start seeing orange spots showing up on the foliage. It's very susceptible to a common rust that we have. And if Larry was still here, he could tell you all about that rust. But I just tell my workers that if you see a plant with a lot of orange spots all over the leaves, it's probably buckthorn and you want to pull it out. But this will often get mistaken for a little crab apple tree. Uh, people will have these in their yards and think they're wonderful plants and don't really realize what they've got. But the birds love the fruit and spread the seed all over the place. And it's become a very serious weed problem in a lot of shelter belt situations and in home yards too. So that first one is common buckthorn. 
Next one here is another plant that we see a lot of around South Dakota. Uh, this is just a little green ash seedling. And you think, well, gee, green ash trees, that's good, but uh, like a lot of other trees that produce a lot of seeds, and this is a little bit wilted, but they can uh, pop up in a lot of places, often next to a foundation or something where you really don't want them. So it's not the best kind of plant to leave around. And you want to, with all of these plants, it's best if you can dig them out and get them out of the yard that way or out of the garden that way as opposed to just cutting them off. As you cut them off, they just come back with two or three more shoots than what you started with and it's going to be fighting it for several times. So just a common green ash. Here's another one that we've had a lot of trouble with around the gardens. This is honeysuckle. Again, you might like honeysuckle and I like honeysuckle too, but when it starts popping up in all of your planting beds all over the place, you probably want to get it out. And again, with this plant, if it's small, you can pretty easily pull it out. It doesn't have a real extensive root system. It has these opposite leaves. And I believe if you cut through a, a stem, it's going to be hollow inside. It's a good way to identify the honeysuckle. And my last one here is elderberry. And again, a lot of people like elderberries. Uh, I like elderberry too. I've got some big patches of it growing in my yard and, and home. but. Uh, again, the birds like to eat the fruit and deposit the seeds, and pretty soon you've got elderberry plants coming up all over the place. And I brought a sample in a couple weeks ago, uh, trying to get Mike to help me identify what it was. And I talked with Gary Larson, uh, who is a great plant taxonomist, and he said, well, he thinks it's elderberry too. And apparently when you chop these plants out, you stimulate this rhizome production underneath the soil, and pretty soon you've got plants coming up all over the place. So. Mm. I've told my, my workers at the gardens, when you pull these things out, make sure you get it all, so otherwise you just make them angry and they just come back with a vengeance. So work on those weeds, both the herbaceous and the woody ones. They can be just as much of a problem and oftentimes more difficult to get rid of. Okay. Well, good. Uh, Dave, on the uh, buckthorn, is there the little thorn part on the sample you brought in? I was going to see if we could show folks why it gets that name. but. And then the, the buckthorn berries are kind of like individual berries that show up on the plant, right. whereas choke cherry will be, the berries will be all clustered together is mm -hmm. perhaps another way that yep. they can kind of... There's, these are still herbaceous enough yeah. that they don't have the thorns have showing that. up. Okay. But the thorns will come right in the tips of the twigs as those twigs harden up. And you might not think they're all that spiny, but you start trying to deal with a bigger plant and you'll soon find out why they're called buckthorn. <laughs> they can be pretty vicious if you aren't careful with them. So do be careful if you're working with them. There's one of those... Just starting to show up one of those orange spots with the rust, but uh, look for the very distinctive venation pattern. And these plants are pretty easy to pick out in the spring, throughout the summer, and even into the fall. They stay hold on to their leaves later than a lot of other plants do. They're just they're a real survivor kind of plant, but one that you don't want to have too much of. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you, Dave. Mike, has the weather been favorable for weeds? Yeah, well, boy, yeah, I guess so. I want to talk about wind and rain, but before I want to talk about some of the weeds here too. Uh, you know, I, we just moved out in the country into a, you know, and we got shelter belt. I've been working on cleaning out the shelter belt, so I was getting flashbacks here as you're going through some of these. I was starting to have the nightmares were reoccurring, but the buckthorn, yeah, it looks just like choke cherry. Uh, and I think I accidentally cut out some of my choke cherry thinking it was buckthorn and so that's not really good You know, I, I certainly didn't really want to do that But yeah, the choke cherry is flowering right now I think and so you'll see those little clusters of flowers and so kind of be watching for that and um, You probably don't want to cut out the choke cherry, but Buckthorn you got to keep on it or it'll just take over that shelter belt turning it into just a brushy wasteland And so we gotta we gotta watch out for that uh, wind and rain uh, wind Oh, I had a call from just a very upset person today uh, Whole house smelled like 2,4-D the neighbor two stories two uh, two houses down was spraying their entire lawn And it just it just uh, smelled and, and people you know, she's worried people are getting sick and that sort of thing in these windy conditions, got to watch the spraying. I mean, it, right now it's risky anyway. For one, the perennial dandelions aren't going to be that susceptible to herbicides this time of year. They're, you're going to get a lot better control in the fall. But if you do want to spray, the best thing you're going to be doing would be just a little spot spraying, or if you are going to, I mean, if you really want to spray your yard, uh, maybe section it off and do small sections one day at a time, something like that. If you're spraying your whole yard right now, that, that those vapors are going to volatilize and it's going to carry and just keep in mind, people living around the area, they probably don't want to smell that stuff. And so uh, be watching out for that under these windy conditions. Just urge everybody to have some caution there uh, with, with that sort of thing. Rain. I was out working on my shelter belt last week, uh, doing some spot spraying, getting the nettles and the burdocks, that sort of thing. Just get done after spraying for about two hours and it starts raining. 
And so one question people might have is, will that hurt the weed control? And, and it can. Generally, um, you want to wait maybe one to four hours uh, after spraying before the rain hits, if you can. I know that's hard to do now with, with, the, with the rain. Uh, but you, there is a rain fast period, and usually uh, you want to let that dry on the plant before you get the rain in order to get decent control. Uh, I've seen some 2,4-D labels that mention waiting two days uh, before it rains, uh, which I'm not sure if we've had two days between rains here in <laughs> South Dakota this year, so that's tricky. So uh, watch out for the rain fast period, but uh, hey, yeah, keep at the weeds. Just be cautious with this wind and this rain. Yeah. Because it's amazing how far that, and it's not only the, the spray droplet itself, it's like you say, when that droplet stays where it's supposed to, but it turns into a vapor. Right. That on those phenoxies, how they And it, a lot of times it's really the, the carrier in the herbicide that you're smelling, not necessarily the herbicide itself, but nevertheless, it, it can make people sick. I mean, some people are very sensitive and they get splitting headaches just catching a whiff of it. So be cautious of that right now, especially living in town. Just kind of keep in mind the neighbors, you know, watch out for that stuff. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Yep. Casey, what do you have for us tonight? <clears throat> well, I've, I've gotten a few phone calls uh, about, and, and it's a pest bird species, I think, if, if, <laughs> it would be, be the, the best way to describe it. Uh, Eurasian collared doves, um, and these are, are uh, kind of newcomers to North America uh, that, that uh, came in in the 1990s into Florida and then spread like wildfire across uh, the country. Um, in the early 2000s, we started seeing them here in South Dakota. They're, they're bigger than our native morning doves. They're chunkier. Um, they originally came from oh, southwestern Asia, Turkey, Afghanistan, that area, spread across Europe. Um, and uh, island hopped really well. They made it all the way to Iceland, so they're, they're very good dispersers. Uh, and once they got into North America, they really spread rapidly. Um, I think in the, in the next slide, you can see that what the population has done here in South Dakota, um, this has been an exponential increase in numbers uh, f since about 2001. Uh, when they first started showing up in the state. And this data comes from our annual Christmas bird count. Uh, and that's the other thing about them, they don't migrate. They're here all winter. Uh, and so we're, we're somewhat worried about competition with native morning doves uh, with, with, uh, with this species. Uh, this is the native one that we have, the morning dove. You can see has kind of a pinkish hue a lot of times along the neck um, and, a, and a pointed tail. Uh, is the ident really identifying characteristic on morning doves, uh, and it lacks the black collar that the uh, uh, Eurasian collared dove has here in the next picture. You can see uh, uh, the, the black collar on this, and it has a squared tail, and again, these are a little bit chunkier birds. Uh, the next one, I think, shows this. You often see them sitting up on power lines or up on, on the end of a pole, and you'll see that big square tail. They sound a little bit like morning doves with a smoker's cough. <laughs> like like uh, I hear them here on campus a lot. And, and uh, <clears throat> so uh, I, I get a lot of phone calls about these birds, thinking that they're ring turtle doves or, or different things. But they're Eurasian collared doves. They're newcomers to the state. Uh, Game Fish and Parks allows you to remove them just like they do uh, pigeons uh, from farmsteads. but. Uh, as of yet, that we haven't really seen them in the rural landscapes as much as we have in cities and towns. Um, but I, I suspect it's just a matter of time before they kind of spread out into, into more rural areas. So there, there's not a season per se? Not that, no, it's, it's, uh, it's open any time. Okay. <laughs> and you mentioned chunky or so on. Is there anything there that's worth eating? Well, you know, I think morning doves are very good eating yeah. birds, and from what I, I, I've never eaten a Eurasian collared dove, but from everybody I've talked to that has, they said they're very tasty. <laughs> so. right. Okay. Well, thank you, Casey. Yeah. So. Well, several weeks ago, Gardline traveled to Rapid City to learn about propagating plants. Rick Abrahamson, Pennington County Extension horticulture educator, demonstrated several different propagating techniques. This week we'll learn how, in some Asian countries, herbaceous grafting produces two different crops from a single plant. 
Uh, now I'd like to demonstrate a couple of different uh, techniques. One is called herbaceous grafting. And in many uh, oriental countries, especially Korea and Japan, approximately 95% of the tomatoes and the uh, watermelon are all grafted plants. Now, you might think, why would you graft tomatoes onto what? Well, what they do is they graft tomatoes onto potatoes, and they get tomatoes on the top and potatoes on the bottom. Of course, that doesn't work real well if it's the other way around. Potatoes on tomatoes, not going to get much of a crop. You can see here, this is one I grafted a few weeks ago that's taken. This, when the weather warms up here, we can stick this outside in the garden. We should have potatoes down here and tomatoes up here. It's a very easy process. You just start with two, uh, the two plants, and it's best if they're similar diameter, and these ones aren't, but it'll still work. About pencil diameter is about perfect. So here we have a potato plant. So I'm going to cut that potato off, like right about here with a razor blade. And I'm going to snip this uh, leaf off too, because you don't want potato uh, growing up underneath, otherwise it'll favor that. Then I'm going to figure out where I want to cut this tomato piece. And I think I'm going to cut it right here. Again, just snipping right through. Then, then we're going to take our razor blade and we're going to slit right down the middle of that uh, potato. And then we're going to just kind of shave a, a wedge-shaped piece in the stem of the tomato on both sides. Whoops, messed that one up, but that's okay because we got more, toma or more tomato plant here. We shave it till it's a wedge shape like that. I'm going to take a piece of grafting tape and I'm going to put that tomato stem down into the down in the center of that potato. And then I'm just going to use this to hold it together. It's not so important that it it seals it up so much in that it keeps the the scion, which is the tomato, the top part, in contact with the rootstock, which is the potato part. It doesn't have to look real pretty. It can be pretty ugly, but I'm going to have to take that tape off before it starts growing because it'll never stretch that tape. Uh, in the case of that parafilm, that would eventually fall off on its own. So then we have a grafted tomato on a potato. Now this has to be put into a humidity chamber and kept very humid because this tomato, the only way it can get water now is through that potato. So if we keep it in humid, humid conditions, it'll actually take up water through the leaves. The other thing I wanted to show you here is a very timely uh, piece here is uh, an Easter lily bulb. And uh, as we know, Easter lilies are very popular right around Easter time. That week before Easter and right after Easter, people usually have them. And what a lot of people don't know is they can take that bulb from that Easter lily, they can plant it outside and they can grow an Easter lily outside. And it'll usually bloom not at Easter time, but in July or August. But the other thing you can do is each one of these scale leaves, we can break off of here and we can propagate more Easter lily bulbs. It takes about three years, but we can break those off and simply We can break those off and just stick them into media, like so, and uh, that'll form a bulblet and eventually a plant. And in about three years, you'll have big Easter lily bulbs like this that you can plant about 22 weeks prior to Easter and have uh, a blooming Easter lily, hopefully. It is a little more complicated than that, but it's, not, it's kind of fun to just experiment with that stuff. thank Rick for that information on how to uh, propagate or reproduce some of the different plants that we have in our homes and out in the garden. So, well, let's get right to the questions. They're coming in. And so uh, let's see how many we can get through tonight. This comes from Flander, Dave. Uh, blueberries. What blueberry varieties do you recommend to plant? And is it still early enough to where they can plant those yet this year? 
Well, the key is going to be to look for some that are going to be hardy for this area. And that's going to say zone four when you look at those varieties. I think there's one that I've, one that I've got in my yard is called North Star, I believe. Um, the biggest problem we have is not so much the hardiness, though, is that they need that acid soil requirement. So you're going to need to probably dig out that area. We're going to plant and incorporate like half peat moss, half soil, or if you can find some elemental sulfur, uh, work that into the soil before you plant also. And that's going to give you a better chance of reducing that soil pH and having a better chance of getting those blueberries to, to grow halfway decent. You generally need at least two plants to get better pollination and better fruit production. Uh, one plant will fruit on its own, but if you have multiple plants, you'll get a better production out of them. Uh, keep in mind that the birds love those little blueberries, so you're going to need to do some, some screening to keep those birds away from the fruit as they're ripening. I've fed my plant now for probably about eight or nine years, and I think I've maybe had a handful of blueberries maybe twice out of it. Otherwise, Casey's <laughs> friends come in there and swoop down and get them right before I'm going to pick them. So keep the birds away from them, and good luck with it. But like I said, the high pH in our soils typically can be a real problem. So do a soil test first if you want. If you want to just try one, you know, just try a plant or two and see what happens, and you might end up with some fruit. You say two plants, you need something, two North Star and, and North something Star else. And something else, okay. yep. Two All different right. varieties. Okay. Second part to this question, John. How do you control apple maggots organically? Oh, that's a great question. There are ways of doing this, and and uh, really probably the big thing on this one is going to be sanitation. You want to clean up all of those fallen apples. When you get that nice windfall on there, and, and uh, trees will tend to shed those apples pretty early, and really they're going to shed the apples first that may be infested with some of those things. Trees have a tendency to do some of that. And, and so a lot of those apples that drop may have some of those in there. Clean those up, get them out of there. It's not just a case of piling them up and leaving them. You want to remove them from that area. Um, but even doing all of that won't remove the possibility of having the flies fly in and, and uh, lay more eggs. So another neat method out there, I know John Ball advocates it a lot. I think it works pretty well in these cases is to bag individual apples. They have uh, fruit bags that you put on the trees for the ones you want to protect. And as those apples start forming, you put that bag around there. It's a clear plastic bag that goes around there, allows air to pass through it and things, but won't allow those apple maggots to get at it. And it protects that developing fruit and, and prevents them from laying eggs on there or from the maggots getting into it. Other thing that can be done along those lines, not as effective as the apple bags, but it does work is to use the uh, the red apple baits. They look just like a forming apple, but they're colored red, and you cover them with tanglefoot, which is a sticky trapping substance. And any flies that land on it get stuck in it. They prefer that red color. They like a ripe apple to a, a developing apple, and so more of them will tend to land on that and get stuck, and it will reduce population in the tree. Okay. And in the past, I've asked this question as far as the home brews and the milk jugs. The different baits that are out there that people come up with. Yeah, and that's another one of those, you know, if you're having some good luck with it, definitely worth a try. Um, in my experience with apple maggots, they are far more attracted to shape and color than they are to odor. And so they're not necessarily going to be attracted to a specific bait that's out there. They're going to be coming looking for that color and that shape up in the tree and looking even for light reflectance up in that tree and, and uh, seeing light shining off of there and looking for specific things like that. But uh, some of those baits can pull in a few of them. The risk that you run with any of those baits like that is that you may attract more of them to that area that weren't there in the first place and you may end up with more of them than you would have had if you hadn't done anything. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Mike, Rapid City. Uh, they have a parking lot with gravel on it. It's under a maple tree. Lots of weeds and dandelions that are coming up. Uh, can this be sprayed with Roundup without hurting that tree? Yeah, and, and you kind of have to watch out a little bit because there's regular glyphosate products like Roundup, and then there's extended control Roundup. And uh, you know, so you want to generally you're going to want to stick with just the straight old Roundup or other glyphosate products. Uh, sometimes those extended control products can have uh, added herbicides in there that can leach into the groundwater and be taken up by the tree roots and, and kill the trees. They're getting better with that. Some of the chemicals that they're adding in um, are a little bit safer now than what they used to be, but you know, you never know. 
you know, like some things you want to watch for and what things you want to avoid are a mazapir, for example. That's a particularly um, toxic one that can be easily taken up in tree roots. So straight Roundup, I know people don't like that because then they have to do more than one application a year, but you'd be surprised. The weeds are only going to come up until maybe about the middle of July here, so we've got about a month more of weeds coming up, and then after that things should slow down until fall. So. Uh, just a straight old glyphosate, straight old Roundup is going to be the best thing. Okay. And that should be no problem. Once it hits the soil, it's going to be bound to the soil, not going to be taken up by tree roots. Right. Uh, Hendricks, Minnesota, Dave. Crab apple trees with suckers around the bottom of the tree. They've cut the suckers, but they keep coming back. What can I use to get rid of these without hurting the tree? Well, I've, John Ball, again, he's our tree expert, and he's talked about doing that sucker removal later in the summer as opposed to doing it in the spring. They'll tend to get a little bit more uh, long-term control if you can do that. There are also some uh, plant growth regulator treatments out there. There's something that's called sucker stopper, I think. Uh, I forget now which chemical actually it has in it off the top of my head, but you spray that on those, uh, that's follow directions if you spray it on the suckers or you spray it on after you've made the cuts, I can't remember now, but follow the label instructions and that's going to reduce some of that. Again, if you can delay cutting some of those suckers off until midsummer, you tend not to get as vigorous a regrowth as you do if you cut them off early in the spring. Yeah, I think that sucker stopper is kind of a, it's a contact, a, kind of a burner type of herbicide. It's kind of an acid type thing. So I think you'd want to put it on before and then, and then let it just kind of defoliate those suckers. But yeah, sucker stoppers, I, I hear people talk about it a lot, but I've never really seen it for sale anywhere. And, and so maybe you could buy it on the internet or something like that. But uh, mm -hmm. It, the most practical approach, yeah, is just going to be to cut them and then just but when I they come in. suggest using a regular herbicide like 240. No, or absolutely or not. Like it's that. tempting because they're so annoying and you're out there squirting anyway. It's tempting to, but no, it'll be, it'll go right up the tree and bad news. Because most cases those suckers are attached to the, the parent plant and so they'll just right. transfer that into the parent yep. plant. So yeah. cutting is about the most, it's not the most fun, but it's about the pra most practical okay. option. From Roslyn, and we may have to do a little interpretation on this one. White covers that you put around your trees, do you leave those on all year? Also, how high do you mulch on trees around, on the trunk? And I assume they may be talking about the plastic wrap Oil, around yeah. the trunk. Uh, generally, we want to put those on in the fall when, say, after we've had some freezing temperatures, it's a good time to put those on. And you want to take them off again in the spring when things start greening up and you start seeing some, some growth on the trees and buds are breaking, that sort of thing. That's a good time to take those back off again. You want to take those off because it does uh, cause some uh, constriction around that stem and it's going to cause a potential for some problems to develop underneath those wraps. So take them off during the summertime or in the spring and then put them on again back in the fall. If you have trouble with rabbit damage, they're a pretty good way to deal with that. Uh, as far as the mulch, uh, three to four to five inches deep or so is probably good, but you don't want to have that right up tight close to the trunk. So keep a little space around the trunk of the base so it doesn't stay too wet. Uh, you get a lot of uh, potential for bacterial and fungal cankers and things like that to develop around the base, especially if there's some wounds there. So mulch are out about you know, the, where the drip line of the tree is or so would be good, uh, but keep it away from the very base of that trunk. As far as mulch, probably what you can buy is a commercial mulch, more so than bagging your grass clippings and putting those around the tree. Yeah, I, I prefer a hardwood shredded material. Uh, I did try some, uh, I got some cocoa bean mulch a couple weeks ago and just tried some at home because I, I was always heard about it and never tried it. And it, it smelled a lot like chocolate. When you walked out the door, I was like, whoa, there's chocolate out here. But <laughs> I noticed, and maybe it's because of all the rain, but after about a week or so, I didn't smell it as much anymore. That probably wouldn't be a bad product to use, but it tends to kind of, it's a lighter mulch. It might blow around a little bit. So just a shredded hardwood mulch uh, is what, what I prefer to use. Uh, grass clippings, you can do things with grass clippings, but again, you want to keep those away from the base of the tree. They tend to kind of get matted down, and, and I'm just not a big fan of using grass clippings for our trees. Okay. KC from Pier. When should I start feeding my Orioles great jelly? And how long should I continue to feed that grape jelly? Well, you can start feeding them right now. Um, they're, they're, uh, they've been eating grape jelly at my house for a few weeks now. Um, and I know others in, here in Brookings even longer than that. Um, and feed them through the summer until they leave for the fall. Uh, 
Uh, and so that's probably going to be sometime in early to mid-September. Uh, but you'll know it when, they, when they're not coming anymore. You can take your feeders down and clean them up and get them ready for next year. And um, preference is grape? It, it is, but I'm doing a little experiment at home now. I've, I've got grape jelly out and I've got homemade choke cherry jelly out and they're coming to both. Hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I, don't, I don't see a preference at this point. Okay. Hmm? Are, are, are there seeds that they would eat as well, or the jelly's well, kind of spendy, and I um, like to eat the jelly. Yeah, <laughs> um, no, I think normally they're insect eaters. Oh, okay. They're not really seed eaters, uh, but they, re they really like nectar, and you'll see them go to flowers and work flowers over, and I think they get the bugs out of the flowers, but they'll also get nectar. They like to come to hummingbird feeders, um, and especially if you have one that's dripping a little bit or has an oversized hole, they'll they'll come and use the uh, hummingbird feeders as well. They kind of have a sweet beak. Huh? They do have a they have a, they've got a sweet tooth or a sweet beak. Yeah, no have teeth. You ever tried like syrup. Um, I have people have told me that they've taken grape jelly and watered it down to make more of a syrup uh, and put it in the commercial uh, Oreo feeders that you can buy and uh, that they're attracted to it. But it's easier just to put a s spoonful of jelly. Yeah. I use the little votive candle holders uh, from the uh, local dollar store. And it makes a nice, a nice uh, little container to hold them in. Yeah. I've been feeding them oranges at my house. And yeah, they really yeah. and those. they like to eat fruit. Uh, cut an orange in half and stick it out there. Uh, they'll eat uh, apples as well. Mm -hmm. That'll attract a lot of butterflies too. A lot yeah. of times fruit like that. So. Yep. Okay. Uh, Mitchell, Dave, tomatoes. The tops are wrinkled, very dark, but they're still green. Any idea what might be wrong with them? Well, I suspect it's just been a little bit too chilly for those tomatoes. Uh, it sounds like maybe if they're getting that dark coloration, maybe there's a little show, showing a little phosphorus deficiency. I think once the temperatures warm up and the soil temperatures warm up a little bit more, I think the soil temperatures are still a little bit chilly. So that's going to help well, along with the, the wet conditions that we've had. Things just need to dry out and warm up a little bit, and I think things will look a lot better. Okay. Brookings, Mike, is it safe to use Roundup around flowers and vegetables to control creeping Charlie or other weeds too? Yeah, right, and, and that's tempting. You know, like, yeah, your flowers, things like that. You've got the Canada thistle coming up uh, among your asparagus, that sort of thing. Uh, what do you do? And their temptation is to sneak in there with Roundup. And maybe you can, but it's a high risk situation. If you just get a little bit of drift, and any of those little fine droplets, and you might not even be able to see them, they get onto your flowers or whatever, vegetable plants, they're goners. And so you gotta be very careful with that sort of thing. Um, there are some wiping techniques you might be able to use, uh, like a 50% solution of the glyphosate product or the Roundup product. Uh, where you can you know, put on rubber gloves and then maybe uh, wet and moisten a towel and wipe that on the plant, something like that. It takes some time, but at least that can minimize the risk. But even that alone, that's not uh, eliminating the risk also. Those leaves can flap around, and if any of those leaves get on the vegetable plant, they're goners too. So it's, it's, this, is a, this is a high risk situation you're talking about. Be very, very careful. It can be done, but just watch out. I've done it myself, and even knowing better, and it killed lots of plants, and so, yeah, it's tough. Uh, Dave, potato related, one from Brookings and one from Rapid City, both dealing with mulch around potatoes. Uh, is it okay to use straw mulch around the potatoes is the one question. The one from Rapid City is, should you mulch potatoes with six to eight inches of straw at planting, or should you wait until they're out of the ground? I would wait till they're out of the ground. I think that you're going to, especially in the spring, if you're planted early, that ground is going to be pretty cold. And if you get that mulch on, they're going to delay that emergence and delay the development of those plants. So I would wait till they get up, you know, three, four inches or so, and then start putting that mulch around there. Straw's fine. Uh, there are people that grow potatoes essentially just in a lot of straw mulch, and they can harvest the potatoes actually in the straw mulch itself if you put enough straw mulch on. But you got to kind of build it up as the plant grows. So. Wait till they get some you know, six or eight inches of growth. Put that mulch down. If you want to wait till they get a little bit bigger, you can put a little bit more mulch around it. Uh, it's going to help keep the soil cool after the plant is when it gets really warm. It's also going to help shade those potato tubers and keep them from turning green. We were talking about that a little bit before the show, but that'll keep the sunlight off the tubers and 
Um, you'll tend to get tubers that are fairly close to the surface of the soil, makes them a little bit easier to dig. The type of season we're having is probably good not to have the mulch on there right now right. to get that soil warmed yep, up a little bit. Yeah, that soil is still cold. I don't know if we're going to hear from Dennis tonight or not, but okay. this, the rains that we've been having, the temperatures have been pretty chilly. It's supposed to be warming up now this week back up around 80 or so, and that's going to help warm those soils up, but they're wet. It takes a long time to warm up those cold, wet soils. Okay. Mulch, potatoes, is that going to bring the slugs in? Are there slugs a problem with potatoes? Not as much. Uh, you know, potatoes are one of those plants that have some of those chemicals that tend to repel or d at least deter a lot of those insects and uh, other creatures. Slugs aren't insects, of course, and so uh, they get lumped in for purposes of discussion, but uh, they're not likely to go after potatoes unless there's nothing else available and then they may eat them a little bit. Okay, good. Thank you, gentlemen. Say, Dave, we're going to take a little break here and talk about an upcoming event. I know we have a little time, but it'd be good for folks to know about it in case they want to get it on their calendar. So. Well, we were just talking about cold, wet soils and a cool spring and everything. Well, there's been kind of a new innovation that's come out called the high tunnel. It's really nothing all that new, but people are learning to use these to produce vegetables and, in some cases, fruit crops in our northern climate to get things out in the garden quicker in the spring and also to extend that season into the fall. I know when I've uh, been to farmers markets, everybody's, where's the tomatoes, where's the tomatoes, where's the tomatoes? Well, you can get tomatoes maybe a month earlier using some of these high tunnels. And there's going to be a workshop uh, in Chester coming up on June 20th. And we've got a couple of noted experts, uh, Dr. Bill Lamont from Penn State University and Mike Bollinger from uh, River Root Farm. He's a certified organic farm in northeastern Iowa. And uh, Bill Lamont has been doing a lot of work on high tunnel production of vegetable crops. So there's going to be a couple of good noted experts there to kind of give you the, the whole ins and outs of using high tunnels, how to install them, what kind of crops to grow, and so forth. There is a uh, $20 per person registration fee. And uh, you can check out the best place to go is probably to look at the uh, Minnehaha County Extension Office, they've got uh, uh, Chris down there is taking kind of the charge of getting this orga workshop organized, or Rhoda Burroughs out in Rapid City. Uh, they'll both be able to give you some good information on how to get uh, signed up for that. Okay, good. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting thing how that's really caught on, that concept really of extending the season, spring or into mm -hmm. the fall. Mm -hmm. so. It's essentially just a hoop house, greenhouse essentially, but there's no heat inside. Oftentimes it'll have you'll have it set up so that you can roll up the, the sides on the bottom to get air circulation there when it gets warm during the summertime. But you can get a lot more production for a lot longer season by using those. Okay, and we'll talk about that again, I'm sure, before sure. the actual workshop. So, good. Uh, rhubarb, Dave. Uh, well, I got <laughs> now. This is a new, unique combination. We got Westenden Springs. They want to know about rhubarb, and then from there we go to bullheads. <laughs> so we'll hit you too also, KC. Uh, on the rhubarb, they sprayed it with Roundup and also burned it. Still keeps coming up, wants to get rid of it, and how deep one uh, works on those roots. So that's kind of a Dave Mike question on this one. So, Well, I've partially burned some of my rhubarb too because I had too many weeds, and I did what Mike suggested that you don't do, and I've tried spraying around it. They are sensitive. You'll get some damage on the plants, but I've got plenty of rhubarb, so I'm not going to miss it too much. But... Uh, they can have a pretty deep root system. Once they get established, that root system can go down a, a foot or more, I would say. So it's going to take some time to get that out of there. Remember, the, the easiest thing to get rid of it, I would say, is to try to dig some of that crown and that root system out of there, and then if you get some regrowth, maybe hit that with the Roundup if they're trying to get rid of it. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like, yeah, it, you might have to come back, but right. yeah, right. eventually just keep at it and you'll deplete that root. So deep or how deep would you have to go on this? I'd say dig down about a foot or so and just okay. try to get as much of that root out of there as you can. Uh, it's, it's a pretty tough plant once it gets established. It's pretty hardy and it's going to come back to haunt you for a while if you're trying to get rid of it. But okay. Offer it for giveaway and see who comes yeah. out and digs yeah. it up for you. People will take a lot of those I don't want to get too much of it now that it's been burned with Roundup. But. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And the second part of that, Casey, uh, and it's got more of a nutrition aspect oh, as far as this uh, is concerned with bullheads. Uh, are bullheads good for omega-3? you have any idea I as far no as clue. on that one? So. <laughs> okay. I probably should consult a, uh, a, a nutritionist, <laughs> I would yeah, guess, on those. I, I, uh, I don't, I, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm clueless. Yeah. I would think they'd have 
uh, more omega threes than a lot of other meat products. Yeah, fish. you know, but I think there's a big, big difference among fishes even mm -hmm. uh, compared to salmon or something. Exactly. Yeah. So, so oil, isn't it? In some of the yeah, I think it has to do with oils and and a lot. There's certain types of fishes that have more of those oils. So. Okay. Uh, Dave, fern peonies. Is it too late to transplant fern peonies, and do I need to, or do I need to wait until next year? Well, if you got the opportunity to wait, I would say wait until September. Uh, that's probably the ideal time to transplant and divide peonies. Uh, right now, at least the fern peonies in McCrory Gardens are just in full bloom right now. Uh, you can transplant them if you have to, and again, it's a tough, durable plant once it gets well established. But again, you've got a pretty massive root system there to deal with. So it's best with peonies to wait till September after they're getting ready to go dormant. Uh, in the spring, those shoots can be pretty brittle and you can cause quite a bit of damage pretty quickly if you're not careful with them. So I'd, it's best to wait till fall. Okay. Mike, two questions here related to uh, the use of plants after being treated with a herbicide. One from Aberdeen, one from Marion. Uh, the viewer from Marion says she would like to remind everyone that uh, fresh sprayed lawn clippings for broadleaf weeds should not be used for mulch, and we talked about broadleafs. The one from Aberdeen is how long should one wait after using crabgrass preventer on the lawn before the grass clippings can be used in the garden as mulch? Okay, yeah, yeah, good points to bring up. Um, uh, the crabgrass preventer is like a granular thing, might be a weed and feed with a fertilizer on a clay granule. Uh, those, there's really no restrictions on those. Once you get those out there on the granule and then that gets into the ground and um, so, you know, I wouldn't do it the first mowing after, but after one mowing, it should be no problem uh, with, the, with the weed and feed type uh, crabgrass. But one glitch on this, though, is there's also sprays for crabgrass after it comes up. Uh, so you might see, like, weed be gone plus crabgrass, and there's different products that'll say plus crabgrass. Those, you're going to want to wait for several mowings because those will, that herbicide will stick in the grass clippings for uh, maybe three or four, mo three or four mowings. And so for the post-emergence crabgrass herbicides, watch out. Don't want to use those clippings for three or four mowings. The broadleaf herbicides, the general broadleaf lawn type things, um, you know, you're probably going to want to wait a couple mowings, um, you know, two, three mowings, something like that. But generally, those aren't going to linger in the grass clippings uh, real long, and so not a huge problem there. The biggest problems with those, like we mentioned earlier, is going to be the drift and those vapors. Uh, that's going to be the big problem with those. So uh, you want to wait a couple mowings on those, but the crabgrass herbicide sprays are going to be the ones that might catch people off guard. Okay. Well, as always, we encourage our viewers to send in questions or pictures of some of their problems, and then we address those on the show. Uh, the, the first one we're going to talk about here uh, is, a, uh, is a picture that kind of came from Millbank. Um, and Dave, you had a chance to view this, and I guess we don't have one uh, for the show tonight, but it's a maple tree that's losing its bark. And last year, a large branch lost its leaves and had the branch removed. Now the bark surrounding the spot is falling off. The problem extends down the base of the tree, but does not seem to affect the area above the cut. There are several white insect webs under the bark, but not too many. Uh, the wood behind the loose bark seems firm and not mushy. Do you think the tree will survive? And is there anything I can do to help the tree to recover? And while you're talking about that, I'm going to fold this picture over, and maybe our cameras can pick up this picture that we received here. So. Well, it's hard to tell for sure from the image that it, it, my guess is if they had this limb die on this tree that there was some sort of a canker disease involved there and I think that's what's killing that bark uh, down below where that, that wound is. Uh, it's kind of hard to see on the picture that we're showing on the, on the screen there, but uh, whenever you see bark like that sloughing off and coming off, there you, there's a better picture of it. Uh, you can see that there's some whitish discoloration to that bark underneath where that wound is. So there's, there's some kind of a fungal infection or a bacterial infection or something going on there that's killed that, that branch as well as the bark around that. I don't think there's anything that you can really do ab about it other than to just remove that loose bark and you might start getting some new wood growing up around that wounded area. But uh, it's obviously a pretty severe damage to that tree. Uh, I would keep an eye on it, and you might want to even have a certified arborist take a look at it in a, in a few years to make sure that that base is not getting decayed where this could be a, a potential hazard tree that could fall in your house or on your garage or on your car or whatever. So get it checked out after you know a while here if it doesn't seem like it's getting any better, 
you might want to have that tree removed just from a, from a safety standpoint. Okay. And they mentioned some webbing underneath some of that loose bark, and usually they're just taking advantage of that as a home. They're not really right. insects that cause problems right. to that tree, are they? Yeah, in that picture there are a couple white spots that are evident there anyway, let's put it that way. And I wish we had a closer picture of it. Um, I think they did well to observe those things and to, to notice them, but uh, again, I wish we had a little bit closer picture. I did magnify them as much as I could, and from what I could tell, I would guess that they're actually from a spider. We've got a number of spider families that don't build traditional webs. They build a little structure like that to rest in at night or during the day or whenever they're not hunting, and, and uh, I think that's probably what it is. And they're just taking advantage of that shelter under that loose bark, and they won't cause any harm to the tree, and they're not likely to do any further damage. It's just using that place to their advantage. Okay, thank you. KC, question here. How do you keep finches and feeders from uh, longer than one feeding? Uh, they're using about one year old Niger seed and they, they, they want to keep that feeder clean, so. Oh, um, I, I'm not, I guess I'm not real sure. How, how do they keep? How it? do they keep them there for more than one feeding? Oh. Where they keep coming back and they're wondering uh, if it's the seed that they have. As no, far as well, you might want to replace the seed. I, birds, as far as we know, don't have a really good sense of taste. <laughs> and so um, I, I've used old, uh, the thistle seed or niger seed uh, that I've, I've kept a year from one, uh, you know, one, one season to the next and never had an issue with it. Uh, the one thing you do want to look out is if, if uh, if you see any uh, any growth of, of uh, fungus or anything in it, then just discard it and and start over. And you might you might want to just try to do that: is go buy a small batch of new seed and try that and see if they keep coming back. And if and if they do, uh, just get rid of your old stuff and, well, and keep had, with it. It might be uh, at least in my feeder, I had a lot of leftover seed from last year in, that was in the feeder all winter and it looked fine but they weren't too crazy about it. Yeah, it, it'll kind of cake up in there and, yeah. and what I found with the Niger seed is is uh, I have much better luck uh, attracting and keeping goldfinches there if I use the sock type feeders rather than the tube feeders that have the really little opening because they tend to, those little openings tend to plug and I would always just carry a toothpick outside and always kind of be loosen, loosen that up. Mm -hmm. and, and so I just went to using sock feeders and, and I've had no issues at all. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dave, the topic that we've been hearing in the news uh, lately with the flooding and higher water. The questions here we have uh, relate to lawns. Any idea how long grass will live, South Dakota bluegrass, uh, underwater? Trees, any idea how long they will last? Uh, they were planted last fall, six to eight feet tall. Um, any ideas? Well, it's going to vary quite a bit with the different kinds of trees. Some that are native to areas where they are going to get flooding occasionally, they aren't going to be as affected as trees that are more upland species. Um, I'm not sure if it's on the web or not, but there is a publication that, again, John Ball put together on flood damage in trees and it lists a variety of different species and, and their susceptibility or adaptability to being flooded. The issue that we're going to deal with here is we're they're talking about flooding for maybe a couple months and there aren't too many trees, especially during the middle of the growing season like we are now, that can tolerate that kind of flooding. They're better adapted to flooding in the spring before they've leafed out. Flooding now is going to be pretty serious for those trees and likewise with uh, a lot of our lawn grasses and so forth, they aren't going to be able to tolerate being submerged underwater for you know, several weeks. That's going to be pretty devastating. So I'm afraid you're going to have some reseeding and replanting to do after the water comes down later in the summer. Okay. Uh, Dave and John, apple maggots. Is it okay to use apples that have apple maggots in them or should they not be used? I think that one really depends on your tolerance for uh, sharing your apple with an insect. The apple maggots won't hurt a human at all. Um, I joke a lot about adding a little extra protein and they certainly do add a little extra protein to the apple. People find it a little repulsive to bite in and find that half of a, a maggot squirming away from them, but uh, other than that they won't hurt the fruit in any way. They make uh, little tunnels through it that people don't like the appearance of. But make they apple sauce out of them or something. Yeah. Okay. Oh, 
Yep. So it's more psychological than it is any toxic or detrimental to you. Completely you. psychological. So. Yep. Okay. Uh, Dave, one viewer that called in said, remind the individuals that cocoa mulch can be toxic to dogs and cats. So that's something, I, I guess, for the pet owners that. to keep that in mind if you're using mm -hmm. the cocoa mulch. But it does smell good. So, okay. And that's all the time we have for this evening. Just to let you know, Garden Line does repeat twice each week on South Dakota Public Broadcasting Digital Channel 3, also known as the Create Channel. The Encore broadcast can be seen Thursdays at 11 a.m. Central and Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central. Check your local listings to find SDPB Digital Channel 3 where you live. And as we wrap up, thanks to our panel of experts, John Keekafer, Brookings County Extension Educator, David Graper, SDSU Horticulture Department Head and Extension Horticulturalist, Mike Mechnin, Extension Weed Specialist, and KC Jensen, SDSU Wildlife and Fisheries Sciences. Thanks to our phone volunteers, the folks from the Brookings Area Master Gardeners, and thanks to you for watching and calling in. On behalf of the entire crew, have a good evening and happy gardening. Funding for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership and the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by Swiftel Communications.